three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at 213. Thank you for coming. Let me give you a little bit of background of why we're even doing this. Two years ago, we started, you know, that this year we landed, 50 years ago, we landed on the moon. Apollo 11 landed on the moon in July, 1969. So we started celebration activities over two years ago. The panels are part of that. <laughs> So Dr. Barnhart had asked me to head up the German American Heritage Committee. I'm working in close coordination with Jack Stokes, Jack, way, yay, Marshall Retirees Association, Benny Jacks heads that up, but we have combined forces and we were asked to do panels. So there are technical panels, so you'll hear from the engineers, and a lot of them are here tonight. So thank you for coming. You hear Again, the technical ones, I've been sitting in on some of those planning meetings, they're wonderful. So please come out to those. Most tend to be at the Space and Rocket Center, Discovery Theater, or the Net Geo, and along those lines. There is a copy of the schedule at the front. If you'd like one, I need to make a correction right away. And it's coming up soon. That's the one on the front page for 5.30, Skylab. Has that one been fixed? Uh, it's it not, needs it's been moved to the 29th. Right. Right. Uh, and it's moved from location. It's now back in the National Geo. It's right. So the time for the Skylab panel is 5.29 <laughs> in the Nat Geo Theater. The date, the date is Right. Time is still the same, two thirds. So. All right. And we're, they, it should be correct on the Huntsville.org website. If you will go to the Pass the Torch, you'll have to look up Pass the Torch or Lectures. If you do a search for lectures, you'll get to all of this same thing, and we're making sure that that stays up to date. <clears throat> All right, so that's what we're doing, and Celebration Week will be very busy, but that's all on there. Tonight you're here to hear about Return to Peenemunde, which is kind of like going to revisit family history. What happened? Why Peenemunde? Ed Buckby put in his book, The Greatest Space Generation, it's, he considered it the cradle of rocketry. And then Kenny Mitchell, would you stand up, please? He has since written a book, Cradle of, Cradle of American Space Exploration, for sale. Space and Rocket Center, all proceeds go to the scholarship fund. So. But he tapped in on that. So he was listening to some of our panels, and we couldn't get things straight. We were revolving off into storytelling. So he wrote a book to make sure all of the details got straight. So, and he also celebrates Huntsville for all the technology that was developed here. That's a wonderful culmination there. Puts it all together in a nice, neat volume. Again, it's, Kenny, what's the name of it? The Cradle of American Space Exploration. Yes. Huntsville, Alabama. Yes. All right, very good. I meant to bring a copy, sorry. Okay, so it all started Rocketry, as you know, was just blossoming in the 1930s, so forth. Most of you are connected with and interested in space history. It all started in Germany. A young man named Werner von Braun was very into this. At first, he was not doing well in school until he got inspired by Dr. Ober's book. And he started, he said, oh, I need math and physics for this. So he started doing that. There's a wonderful picture of, I should have included it, but where he's just, he's acting as a, uh, a mentor for Klaus Riedel. He's in a white coat, walking behind Klaus Riedel about 14, 15, and so forth, but early rocketry. They worked at Kummersdorf near Berlin. 
Von Brown's white coat is actually black, and the other man is just stark white. So you know who did the work. <laughs> black with grease. Yeah, black with grease. grease. Yeah, yeah, man, it was white underneath. Yeah. <laughs> so, the it's, other guy, his was what? Yeah. That's Jackie Dannenberg, by the way. She'll be one of your speakers tonight. So, oh, all right, so Von Brown's mother, well, Okay, so they're starting to work on rockets, building rocketry and so forth. Well, building, developing, just fun, more or less, uh, what, what was it called? It was called BF, it, you happen to know, Crystal? I can't remember. Anyway, BFR, rocketry. Fine meaning group for, so they were developing rocketry. Now the war is starting, World War II is starting. Versailles Treaty from World War I, they didn't write in, they wrote in, you couldn't use, build all of these, Germany could not build all of these armaments and so forth. Well, rockets weren't developed at the time, so rockets were not written into the Versailles Treaty after World War I. So guess what? The government decided, okay, well, this is something that we can build, and money started being pumped into rocket development. So Von Braun's mother, Von Brown was tapped to head up this effort. His mother said, suggested to him that they use the site at Tainamunda, and you'll see it on the map. It's on the Baltic Sea. It would be a safe place to develop test rockets. So with late 30s, they started building up Tainamunda, and within a matter of short order, they had huge buildings built. Lots of, about 6,000 employees or more. It was just a buzzing little town. In fact, there wasn't enough housing. You heard of something like that? A lot like Huntsville, Alabama back in the early 50s and 60s. But there was not enough housing. They lived in all the neighboring villages. The secretaries came in and the math workers and so forth. So, Pena was growing. Well, the rest of the story is that at the end of the war, Von Braun and his teammates were trying to get away from the Russians who were moving in at Panamunda in 1945, say spring 1945, so they were headed south. The Hitler had put out the order to execute <coughs> these scientists. He didn't want them falling into enemy hands. This was his brain trust. So they're kind of meandering down through the country, trying to hide from their own countrymen and trying to hide from British, the French, and of course the Russians. So they end up down in the south because Von Braun said, I know that's where, that will be American territory. We would like to go there and try to meet up with the Americans. And that's what happened. So that's the story you're going to hear on the film. Then we wanted to revisit because we're family members. Jackie and I and these two, <laughs> I'll introduce them in just a moment, but, but they love the story as well. So I'm a daughter of Fritz Weber, who was one of the team members that ended up going through El Paso. I was born in El Paso. Klaus Heimberg was born in El Paso. He's here tonight. So then we ended up moving to Huntsville in 1950 when the whole 9,330th, which Marge Bledsoe's father came with. He was a supply chief for that. So they all, a whole group of them came to Huntsville, the GE folks as well, in 1950. Very little housing, familiar theme, right? So then rocketry, you know the rest of the story, but we're going to go over our trips, our return to where it all began. So first, Jack, well first, the video. These two, Dick Curtis and Blake Hudson, traveled back in 1991. You know the Berlin Wall came down, or the wall came down East Germany, across East Germany in 1989. Well, that's when an entire group got together and wanted to go back to see what Pena looked like, where they had worked, and these two, managed to get some funding, and they went along and filmed this return. So you will see their video, their movie. So Dick's the actor, uh-huh, and Blake did the filming. <laughs> then next you'll hear Jackie was there with her husband, Conrad Dannenberg, 
And she went in 91 and in 1992, so you'll hear her story. And then in 2010, I came up with a little group, small group, and Buffy agreed to go with us. So 2010, we went back and had a wonderful three days of seminars and things like that, you'll see that. And then in 2017, we wanted to go back and recognize the 75th anniversary of the first successful launch into space, October the 3rd, 1942. Dr. Barnhart at the Space and Rocket Center traveled with us for that. So you'll get to see some on that. So there you go. So first the film, then 1991, 92, then 2010, 2017. See, so we're getting closer to today. All right, but first it's the film. Come on up, if you, would you like to say a few words or? You already said it. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. What she said. All right. Yeah. This is Dick Curtis. Yes. Blake Hudson. I, I want to know if you've still got that sweater. <laughs> <laughs> you wore the same sweater for two weeks. <laughs> it was continuity. It's filming. I apologize, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hung it out to dry. Air dry. Air dry. <laughs> uh, so how did this come about? Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. We can credit him. Do you remember the uh, two words, glasnost and Perestroika, was it? Mm -hmm. Openness and all that. Uh, the Soviet Union was kind of like on its way down. And uh, since they were like in charge of Eastern Germany <coughs> and East Berlin, uh, you weren't going to do anything. You weren't going to paint them in. Paint them in, it was in Eastern Germany you know, uh, after the, the Soviets came in after the war in 1945, deep into it on the Baltic. And that's where we were going to go. So I was jotting down some dates here. In November of 89, uh, an East Berliner, one of the officials, got on television and said, this like in November, said, in the near future, we're going to let East Berliners cross the wall. And that's what he was supposed to say in the near future. What he said was, tonight we're going to let them cross the wall. <laughs> 10,000, thousands of them. They, they, they broke down the gates as it went on, and they, that's it. So that's, that's when it initially happened. But it wasn't until uh, June of 90 that they began actually dismantling, dismantling the wall. And then uh, yeah, it was completed in 91, because we, we were in Berlin in uh, the, that September, September. September. And part of the wall was still there. Exactly. Yeah. Big chunks. So anyway. so anyway, our trip was in, in 91, and we heard inklings of it, probably read it in the newspaper, but it's on TV, people get their news. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that Conrad Danberg, Jackie's husband, was going to have this uh, gathering of some of the German rocket engineers. And a lot of people in Huntsville knew that the Germans came from, from Texas somewhere, Fort Bliss or whatever, but not too many people really knew about Pena Mundi, you know. I mean, that's, even today, more to us. They don't, don't, don't know about it. But that was, that was their Cape Canaveral. That was a very important place. And so I called Jackie. We did, I didn't, I guess I called Conrad or somebody. Anyway, we got together and Jackie said, yes, we're gonna go and we're gonna go next month. Can you go? And I go, well, no. So we approached the general manager and said, sure, come up with the money, you can go. That's the way it works in the television. Uh, so anyway, we got going, got, a, sure did. got going to fund it. And uh, you gathered up all your gear. And you had videotape back then? Yes. Yep. Separate camera, separate recorder, separate. a lot of tape, uh, separate camera, separate recorder, a box full of tapes, because I didn't know what we were walking into. And we didn't know how much. Each one shot 20, 20, minutes. 20, minutes, 20 minutes. Yeah. Totally walking into something. You know, even though I grew up in Huntsville, like Dick said, I knew more about the Germans coming from, you know, Texas. Pandemunda, I don't think I figured out how to pronounce it until I had gotten my passport because we were that close to flying out of here. And uh, it was an amazing thing. You know, one of the things about a video camera is you get to hit that red button. One of the cool things about it is that the sort of things that you'll pick up afterwards, having all those tapes and recording what was over there, it, a phenomenal experience. And we get to, I love watching this over and over. My son, gets bored of it, but he, he can recite <laughs> different parts of what happened in it, because I've told him some of the background. And one of the things I, I'd love to, which I've looked for, is uh, 
the moments, when there a moment where they're trying to find the exact spot where the first rock was lifted off, mm -hmm. there was a moment where they weren't really sure, and it went around, they were trying to figure out which location it really, really was. And well, I just, the first V2 successful option. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Colonel, yeah. Colonel Mitch Sharp, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know him beforehand, I, I guess. We met this uh, retired girl, and uh, Mitch Sharp. NASA Public Affairs. NASA Public Affairs, mm -hmm. and we were, we were a, a trio. Yeah. We were we were stuck together, and it was great. He was very inside. He knew a lot about the Soviet space program and helped us there. And then at one point, he said, after we were wrapping up in Monday, he says, let's go down to Bavaria. I go, yeah, let's go to Bavaria. <laughs> <laughs> Bavaria is, of course, where the von Braun team members headed down. And the Russians were coming in from the east, and the Americans were coming in from the west. So that was, was fantastic. Oh, really? Oberdorf, I forgot to say. And the hotel was short. Nope. Uh, hotel Ingeborg. 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 Okay. I've got a beer blotter from there. <laughs> <laughs> and then we stopped in Berlin on the way down and did a what we call a stand up. Checkpoint Charlie. Checkpoint. No, well, near there. It was the Brandenburg Gate. Okay. Checkpoint Charlie was there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and there was still part of the Berlin Wall was still there. This is in September, September 91, mm -hmm. even though it started coming down in 89. Anyway, uh, so we're glad we went down there to tell, tell the rest of the story. So, anyway, we'll take it. Somebody under the lights? Uh, I can grab the lights. Okay, yes. Yeah. Tell us how you got Boeing to fund this. Uh, I called the public affairs and uh, said, you know, we're doing this. Oh, she said, that's a great, I forget her name. Uh, she said, that's a great idea. She said, how much do you think it'll cost? Wake up, kind of those lights, moment, about $5,000. $5,000, yeah, we can do that. Um, I can say five minutes, 10. Okay. Here in Germany, trains are a wonderful way to get around. But this train trip couldn't have happened a few months ago. It's a train trip into former communist control East Germany. It's a train trip to Hainemunda. In German, Hainemunda means mouth of the Pena. This is the Pena River. The sweater. It was here. The sweater has become technical director of the German rocket facility called Hainemunda. Today, Soviet warships are crowded at the harbor. An interesting sight, but not what former members of Dr. McLeod's rocket research team are heading to Hainemunda to see. It was at Pena where many Huntsvillians lived and worked during World War II. They were among Germany's top engineers and scientists, and their job was to do what had never been done before, to design and build from scratch a rocket that could travel to the edge of space. Though built to be a weapon of war, it was truly at Pena where the spaceship was born, and our quest for the stars begun. And I'm really looking forward to go back. I think it's a wonderful memory. Once Milligan's Maria and Everhard Reese haven't been to Pena since the war ended in 1945. Until the Soviets gave up control and East and West Germany reunited, Pena was off limits to Westerners, especially former German rocket scientists who used to work there. Dr. Reese worked alongside Werner von Braun at Pena and was later director of the Marshall Space Flight Center. <laughs> On a train in eastern Germany, it's time to make a toast to new freedoms and old friends. Those are two girls from Pena Munde. <laughs> Gela and I, we were roommates in, uh, at Pena We were very young girls. Very pretty young girls. <laughs> <laughs> but we always kept in touch and we are, we are anxious now to see everybody else. <laughs> It's a, it's a homecoming uh, 49 years ago, and the last time I was there was six months old, I believe. So, <laughs> I don't remember a whole lot except the stories. Alex Haas, Dr. Reese's stepson, was too young to remember the old rocket work. 
but other older children of engineers are making the trip too. It's seven hours by train from Hamburg, where many of them flew in. Plenty of time to reflect on their days at this place on the Baltic Sea called Ainamunda. Ainamunda's story begins not with the military, but with amateur rocketeers. Rocketry in Germany in the 1920s and 30s was quite the fad. Even if you weren't of the scientific mind and understood how rockets worked, they made a great spectator sport. Rockets were attached to just about everything that could move. Some things were more suitable to rocket propulsion than others. <laughs> Some of the amateur rocketeers had grandiose plans. They thought they could build a rocket that was big enough and fast enough to break free of the Earth's atmosphere and travel all the way to the moon, perhaps farther. This project was a little premature. Despite their less than impressive beginnings, they did manage to catch the attention of the German military. At the end of World War I, the Treaty of Versailles banned Germany from having long-range artillery guns in their arsenals. However, the treaty said nothing about rockets. In 1932, the German army asked this group of young amateur rocketeers here in Berlin to build them a small rocket. They paid them a thousand marks or so. And the launch was done down in Kuberstor, the army's proving ground. Well, the launch went okay, but most importantly, they were impressed with one of the group's members, the young graduate named Werner von Braun. They were so impressed with him that the army offered him a job. For young 20-year-old Werner von Braun, life would never be the same. Now with backing by the Army, serious rocket research could be done at the Kruersdorf test facility, a facility they soon outgrew. The Brown's military boss asked him to find a larger site in a remote area on a coastline where they could build and launch in secrecy. The Brown's mother suggested Ainamunda a little fishing village on the Baltic Sea. The year was 1937. The way Pena Luna juts out into the Baltic Sea made it an ideal place to launch rockets. As the rocket headed down the coastline, engineers stationed along the peninsula were able to track its progress and find out exactly how well it was performing. Here at Pena Munda, they built laboratories and assembly lines, rocket fuel plants, and test stands. They had their own railroad and residential neighborhoods. From all over Germany were hired the best engineers and scientists. They came from universities and industries. They came to Painamunda to work and live. And then you have to somehow to, to summarize your background, your technical background, and then somebody said, I take him. <laughs> Herman Wiedner was one of the young engineers hired at Painamunda to build the world's largest rocket. On the drawing boards, the engineers called it the A4. The German propaganda department gave it the name Vengeance Weapon No. 2, or V2. If successful, it could hit a target an incredible 200 miles away. But it would also be the first rocket ever to go into space. After years of work, the V2's moment of truth came October 3, 1942, for Peinemunda's test stand No. 7. That was uh, almost a highlight in my, <laughs> in my career, when we really had the first real success uh, flight. Engineer Werner Dinglebach, who was in charge of the V2's electrical system, and it was an important milestone for the German army. 
At the same time the Army engineers were working on the V-2, engineers with the Air Force had their own project, the V-1, which was later known as the Buzz Bomb. The V-1 was more of a rocket-powered plane, much slower than the V-2, but much cheaper to build. The Air Force engineers working on the V-1 had a friendly rivalry with the Army engineers on the V-2 side of Pinamunda. In the end, the V-2 stole the limelight. After all, it was such a rocket that Dr. Van Brown and the amateur rocketeers promised would one day take us to the stars. The workers and family members returning to Panamuda after so many years have looked forward to this reunion, happy to see friends, anxious to locate their former homes and work sites. They knew the war took its toll, but they're still hoping to find some buildings that look familiar, some recognizable landmarks. Yes, I'm going to go over that thing is. They were living somewhere here in this in this area, and they just found out that it's in this corner. This corner of the house must have been. Recently, it was under tight East German security. There was an active air base here under the control of the Soviet Union who overran the area at the close of World War II. This was the first time outsiders were allowed in, the first time American cameras could see inside the former secret rocket works. I remember watching this black and white film of these trees, like these, being cut down when the facility was built. This is history. Wow. <laughs> I think you know we are now on test stand number seven, yes, yes. which was the biggest test stand. We launched a number of vehicles of uh, A4s, as we call them from here. If you could turn back the hands of time to, say, 1942, you would see quite an impressive launch site here at test stand seven, the birthplace of space. There was a large assembly hangar where final checks were made on the A4, or V2 rocket even mobile test stands. Everything the Germans would later help build for us in the U.S. Test Stand 7 was bombed numerous times by the British and Americans. The Russians removed the valuable equipment when they took over. Today, the landmarks are few, but the memories are many. It was fantastic, fantastic. Like, you know, Memories, like the day when the first successful launch was made, and man entered the space age. This is where this is where the space program began. Oh yeah, this was this kind of thing. Right here, right here, right here. Yeah. Yeah. This was the first launch ever into outer space. For the launch, Doretta slid at the best seat in the house, next to the best tour guide in the house. Her boss, Dr. Van Brown. I worked at that time for Werner von Braun as a secretary, and I had to go with him up on the um, roof of the largest building, and then I had to write down every second. He dictated every second what the rocket and what is doing. So, um, so for me, it was just so exciting. Like, you know, it wasn't like a launching today in Florida. You didn't see the planes. We couldn't see them, but we saw the thing going up, and it was just breathtaking at the time, too. But scary. We didn't know what was coming up. Or going down. Or going down. <laughs> Sometimes it went down too early. We had plenty of problems, plenty of difficulties. Uh, so, once in a while, even when I came home late from work, a uh, telephone was ringing, something went wrong. <laughs> so I had to go out again and spend half of the night. We had one, one flight where the thrust and the weight equal. And it was going up about 50 feet or something like that and standing there. 
and then finally to a row and then they're close to our control uh, marker. <laughs> There are very many feelings and I, I would say uh, uh, sentiments that go through you when you visit here. I mean, there was a great start in starting the rockets, which later on took us to the moon. But knowing that it had to be through the war effort, that it, that it was possible really to develop them puts a little damper on things. No doubt the B-2 was a weapon, but it was also a technical marvel. And Test Dam 7, it's show place. There was one relatively big assembly building over here, where the whole B-2 could be put together in the whole thing, and you still could pick it up as a crane and move it from one vehicle, for example, on another one. And we had also relatively large uh, structures similar to the uh, structures we use now at Cape Kennedy from which the shuttle is being launched, which could be moved on rails from the launch site over there into this uh, relatively large assembly building. It seems like it prevented it from slipping out, yes. you know. Uh, it was relatively small to compared to the... See, you found something. Yes, yes. what's that yeah. say? Despite heavy war damage, Test Stand 7 at Peinamunda has remained untouched for the last 45 years. Yeah, I did. These rebel tracks were used to bring the rockets in. It was over this concrete pit the V-2 was test fired. The entire test stand was ringed by a mound of sand for protection. Today, it's still there, but overgrown with trees. Uh, this right here, where noise... One place all were interested in locating was the exact spot from where the V-2 was first launched. Bei den Betonklotz oder diesen Baumstumpf da, was sind da, was ich sehe? Between the concrete ah. slab there and the tree stump. Right there. That area is wow. where he thinks this place is, and I think the same place was used for the first launch. History was made that day here at Test Stand 7. History that would follow to places like Cape Canaveral and Huntsville, Alabama. It was the day the space program began. It began at a little place called Panamunda. <laughs> the beaches along the Baltic Sea in northern Germany are among the most beautiful in the world. The little coastal towns of Zinowitz, Karlshagen, and Panamunda among the most charming. <laughs> Despite some cold winters, this remote part of Germany is probably a pleasant place to live. It indeed was home for many North Alabama families before and during World War II. They were engineers, technicians, mechanics, and office workers. Some worked on the west side of Peinamundo, developing the V-1. Some worked on the east side of the secret facility with the V-2. Since Panamunda was nearly surrounded by water, located at the end of a peninsula, it was easy to control who came and went. Everyone, including school children, had security badges. There was a checkpoint when you first arrived on the peninsula, and a final one for the workers before they entered the rocket plant. For the most part, the engineers volunteered to come to Panamunda. For others, the government decided. We were very young. We were usually, we had just graduated from high school. What Elsa Ebert was one of the hundreds of girls drafted into service at Panamunda. They lived together in dormitories, obeyed strict curfews, and took various jobs around the rocket complex. And it was kind of fun because we were really thrown together with some fascinating people. We had never heard about rockets. We had, I mean, we had no idea what was going on in Peenemünde, but we got educated, we made friends, we had a good time. Even with hard times, we had a good time. Even though their lives were highly regulated, they had it better than many of their friends back on the home front. And though they were sealed off from the rest of the world, 
This was a resort area, and they didn't work all the time. Hat Spaß gehabt dabei, nicht? In Grenzen. Do you have a boyfriend? We all did. <laughs> Naturally. Oh yes, yes, there was time for socializing. Um, we had parties. And let me tell you what I remember most about the parties. I remember being fascinated by these people who were talking with all these engineers who were not talking about what these things they were working on would do to help the war or whatever. No, they were talking about going to the moon. And I thought they were crazy. <laughs> I hadn't heard anything about it, you know. It was wonderful. This talk of space by Dr. Van Brown and others continued to come up, much to the dislike of the military, whose mission here at Panamunda, after all, was to develop a weapon, not a spaceship. Basically, we didn't like the idea. We didn't like the idea in the United States when we, when we expressed the idea of, that we were actually more interested in a, in a space exploration than in the development of weapons. Of course, Von Braun was the guy who really he wanted to go to space flight all the time. And uh, uh, he was interested in this big rocket business, not as a weapon, but as a, a start for uh, going up in space. I sat with Werner in the officer's casino, and he would talk about going to moon and to Mars. And suddenly we realized it was three o'clock in the morning. So it was time to go to bed. <laughs> it's kind of astronautic, you understand? Yeah, yeah. not military. That's yeah. astronautic. Yeah. astronautic. Yeah. astronautic. Yeah. In a way, everyone at or near Peinamunda shared in these first steps in astronautics. <laughs> When they heard that all too familiar roar, all they had to do was look toward the Baltic. We saw them being tested over the Malta, you know, but we didn't know what was going on. Eva Tucker was a nine-year-old schoolgirl when her father went to work at Pinamunda. But did you as children talk about what your fathers did? No, our fathers worked, that's all we knew. We knew, we saw the rockets when they were being tested. Uh, in my, on one occasion, we were on the sports field and uh, we were just having a sports day and one of the rockets went up and came tumbling down and we all ducked. We thought that would prevent us being hit, you know, but it uh, tumbled into the woods further along. And we heard the fire engines then, it was all, uh, but we saw them all the time. Of the scores of V-2s test launched at Pinamunda, many shared a similar fate. The first successful launch in 1942 was followed by months of failures. It was only about half developed when uh, it flew first. And there were still a lot of problems. The thing was not ready and ripe yet, as everybody knows, to be put into production. So that was a relatively tough time period. On the other hand, again, at that time, most of the people were really still highly interested in space flight, and many of them were glad and willing to put the extra hours in. Though the V-2s were test launched at Pinamunda, none was actually launched toward enemy targets from here. The rocket had about a 200-mile range, and London, a likely target, was 600 miles away. The plan was, when the V-2 was perfected, to transport it within range. The British didn't wait for that eventuality. We saw the planes coming in, and we heard them, but we expected that, like almost every day, they were flying to, to Paris, you know? So we weren't concerned at all. On the night of August 17th, 1943, 600 British bombers came on a mission to get the engineers of Pinamunda. It was a get them before they get us mission. The British didn't know too much about the V-2. They just knew it was important enough to stop. But he saw nothing but fire, fire, fire. Everywhere you looked, you know, there was fire. Bombs were falling, the windows came in, the doors fell out. Well, I think this, this was a very ugly uh, thing. This could come as a surprise, I and mean, you were making missiles, and yeah. you had to be on the receiving end. Well, I mean, that the, that's a part of the, of the time of 
fighting, fighting each other and standing in for what you think you should stand for in your home. Ian and Alan. During their reunion at Pinamunda, the former German engineers and workers gathered at a memorial built to remember those who died during the air raid. Those workers drafted into service, or volunteered, coming forward, right or wrong, when their country called. I felt sorry for our generation because we were pushed into a war and it had no, no way out. It was impossible. If you live in a totalitarian regime, controlled press, you did not know what was going on in other places of the world. There's nothing you can do. You're just like a little bee that has to fly where the queen bee flies. After the bombing of Pinamunda, a decision was made to begin building the rockets underground. It wasn't long before the dreaded SS, Hitler's private police force, seized control of production. The SS brought in slave labor, even at one point had Dr. Brown himself arrested. He was uh, arrested because uh, the SS at that time claimed that he spent too much time going about space flight and making all kinds of plans for the future, but he was blamed for not spending enough time to really work on the, uh, the completion of the A4. Late in the war, the SS got its way. Production was pumped up, and the A-4s, the V-2s, headed down the assembly line and toward their British targets. Do you think the engineers were taken in or, or used by the government? Not any more than the engineers that are working at Redstone Arsenal. They have a job. They have an intriguing, interesting job. I don't think you can make the engineers and the scientists responsible for what a political government is doing. They, they unfortunately don't have that influence. Given more time, the V-2s could have had an impact. But they came too late, and things at Pinamunda were getting desperate. I think most of our people uh, were convinced quite a uh, long time ago that the war was lost. And we were sure. Because uh, we knew you could not win the war with an injury. With the Russians moving in from the north, Dr. Van Brown and a team of engineers headed south to Bavaria to seek out the American forces. And if that would not have been possible, then of course we all would have been overrun by the Russians. And the Russians would have had the entire team and all the facilities in Peenemund and eventually also in the Harz Mountains, so manufacturing facilities. The engineers wound up scattered around Bavaria. Dr. Van Brown, along with his military boss, his brother Magnus, and others, ended up at this inn in the village of Oberjo. Early one morning, Magnus headed out on bicycle to find the Americans. Magnus was the best choice because he spoke the best English. He didn't know exactly how far, though, he'd have to head down this road before running into the Americans. Although everyone back at the end knew the German-Austrian border was just a few miles down the road. And the American soldiers were somewhere in the area. <laughs> As it turned out, the Americans found Magnus. They questioned him, learned about the other engineers, and arranged for their pickup. The next day, Bud Brown and his team faced American cameras for the first time. His arm was in a cast from a car wreck the week before. The American soldiers couldn't believe this young German was the creator of the V-2. Within weeks, a brown SWAT team of 118 engineers would be in the U.S. working on the Army's missile program. Five years later, they would move to Huntsville to help the Army launch our first satellite, and then on to NASA for years of space spectaculars. 
Dr. Van Brown would never again see the little town called Pinamunda. This is Dickers at Large reporting. Tell the story about you, you being arrested in the shadows. <laughs> Those weren't really actors, it was just me and Clay. <laughs> sure. uh, we needed to recreate that little incident for where the uh, Mike Magnus was uh, was uh, well, stopped. Uh, stopped by the by the American. Who what was his name? Snyder, Snyder. Sergeant Snyder? Snyder. 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 Yeah, yeah. So we said, okay, so Blake, go get a gun and a rifle and come back. And well, <laughs> didn't he bring one? But he had a tripod. Yeah. So he turned it over. <laughs> he took one leg of the tripod. <laughs> And I said, can you do this in silhouette? He said, yeah, yeah. do this in silhouette, so. And you can see Mitch yeah. faking cocky in the tripod. Loaded the artificial bullets. <laughs> he was a great guy, Mitch Sharp. <clears throat> Just a great guy. You had a question, sorry. Yes, yes. Who were you working for at the time that you took this trip? The CIA. <laughs> <laughs> no, channel, Blake and I were working at Channel 19, WGT. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. 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 And again, we can't thank Boeing enough for funding the trip. They yeah, are very nice. You did a good job. So, can I guess? Oh, uh, and Doretta, yeah. and Brown's secretary. I was over at her house a couple weeks ago. When was that? A couple weeks ago? A couple you weeks ago. A couple weeks ago, yeah. Now. And uh, she was fit as fiddle, as they say. She's 98. 98. Wow. 98. Ah, such a great lady. And Klaus, you go over there a lot, and you go there once a week or whatever, and a lot of people take care of her. So, very good. Uh, I wonder, what was she, oh, she was talking about the, we Heidi and I have gone up there to interview her several times, and uh, <coughs> talking about the night of the British bombing. And she was there with Von Brown you know, in, the, in the office, and uh, come here. Really, what she was saying? I mean, it was it was a it was a harrowing experience. So when she was gathering all the stuff, and right? All I, the, I, the papers. And, I think she had already gone for the night. She had gone straight to the bunker yeah. when the bombing started. Yeah. And uh, she was saying she would go up and grab some of the right. And so he came in as as the bombing was over. She he came in and grabbed her by the hand and said, "Let's go up." And get the papers because she knew right where the valuable papers were. Flames and smoke. And, and they had put the more valuable ones, of course, in a safe. So what happened is he took her by the hand along the the hallway with the flames, as you say, going already. And they counted off the doorways. They were feeling off the doorways as, as they were going. And then they got into that office and they started throwing things out the window in the safe. I think they got some other help and threw the safe out the window. And, so, but, uh, Drawings and papers that ended up at Fort Bliss. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. You know. And apparently he got, Von Brown got out just before that, I want to say keel of a ship, but the, the cross, the long part of the building came down. Mm -hmm. It collapsed inside. So it, all of those would have been just like Dr. Stuhlinger. He's got an amazing story of returning from, from Russia. Russia. So oh, yeah. it's... They all had such close calls, or most of them had very close calls, and it's just amazing how it all came together. I guess that's what inspires us to, yeah. to help tell the story. It's just, but these two were yeah. amazing. There was a book written by uh, Bob Ward, ex, ex uh, Dr. 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 Space. Yeah. 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 It gave, gives you a lot of insight into the early Von Braun and what led to his interest in. in a lot of things, especially science, his mother and his father, and all that stuff. It's a good, it's a good starting point to sort of understand who he was. All of us knew him. He was multifaceted. I remember one time before we were in Washington on, on the NASA plane, we got out to get a taxi, and he was out there, had the hood up with a taxi driver telling him how to change the spark plugs yeah. and, and the coins. <laughs> 
where and how did the Russians get their German scientists? Do you know? No. Where's, they, where's Mitch Sharp? They, they, yeah. They, uh, the, the facility in the Hartz Mountains where they were building the rockets, that's where a group of approximately 2,000 ended up from Peenemunda. So now Von Brown has taken his 500 he had with him, women and children included in that group, about 500. He went down south. Gottschalk was one that was, he was sort of another head, so he became the head of the group that stayed at, I can't even remember the name of it now, in the Hartz Mountains, the name of the Middlebar. Middlebar, thank you, okay, Middlebar. So he stayed there with those and they thought, we will continue working, let's stay here. Well, they did. They continued working for a while, and I'm not sure about that timing, but all of a sudden, one night, a huge train came in and said, all right, you can go with us to Russia now, or you can stay behind and you won't have a job. So most of it, we've got rail cars for your furniture and your families can go. One guy was apparently even told, he said, your wife or your mistress, which one to choose? <laughs> so they, most of them chose to go. They thought they would go to the rocket development facility in Russia. Well, the train went that way and then headed north to an old military camp and they were watched. They were kept in a tight compound. They had, fine, they had a, a okay housing and so forth. They were taken care of, but they were watched over and so forth. And it was reported back to the Russians then what they were developing. They were given tasks to do and so forth on this. Um, on this 19, uh, 1943 bombing, I've got Dr. Stu Landers' uh, book, but I don't remember him ever mentioning about the, the was, 1943. And I was wondering if there's any, anybody that actually has taken the stories, like Conrad, uh, or Dr. Weiner that was in here, did anybody ever take those stories that happened during that uh, yeah, yeah, Karen, I've, I've got a couple stories, but I can wait until I do my presentation. Okay. Okay. But let me finish up. The ones from Russia were then released in 19, after about five years. They were allowed to go home if they wanted to. <coughs> Some didn't come back till about 52, but 50, 52, they were released. So again, the parallels, I wanted to finish up that story. So, okay, and you'll tell that. Yes, Dr. Yes, when you went over here, did you, did you say how soon you were? No. I thought we did. No. It was the no. no. We, we, we stayed. We, we stayed there. Not, not at the not at that hotel. That was not functioning. I don't think. Was it? Was it? I thought it was. They were they were, getting, they were getting ready to renovate it. Yeah. Which is horrible. But anyway, I'm glad we got to see the original. Yeah. We stayed down the road. Down the road. Okay. And woke up to the cowbell. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. Yeah. It was great. I mean, yeah. this is Bavaria. I mean, it was like a Hollywood set. You know, that was incredible. Mm -hmm. Richard's got some nice postcards of hotel. Oh, we do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's what we and hotel Ingeborg. Yeah. But we went through it, but there weren't there were okay. guests or anything. I remember. I, yeah. It was closed down. The postcards I have are from uh, about 1940, 1941. Where oh, wow. it shows oh. the, the the name of the pass was the Adolf Hitler Pass mm -hmm. and over here. And then in <coughs> 1950, uh, one of the postcards it is has been renamed Oreo Pass. We're trying to get we're not getting questions, questions here. We're trying to get the questions. Well, we need to leave this where it is. Okay. Yeah. Did I understand? The V-2 would not reach England from Pinamunda, but there was an upgraded version called the V-4. A-4. No. A-4. It's a different name. A-4 was the V-2. But, but they did launch from Pinamunda during the war. They hit no, just testing. Yes. Where did they do that? Repeat the questions. So he was asking about the, the, the distance, the A-4 or the V-2, would, would it make it from Pinamunda to London? And no, it had a couple of mile range, maybe yeah. at the most. And that's why they launched from Holland. They put a lot of rail cars, and, rail cars launched, got the heck out of Dodge. No, uh, <laughs> and a lot of the launchers were from the Hague. Yeah. Well, since Holland was, they, they could drive in, launch, yeah. and then leave. Yeah, yeah. So they, they perfected that. But they were working on the A-10. 
Yeah. And that was intercontinental, but and when Ed Bugby saw that one in the museum, the A-10, he says, I see the Saturn V. He was already looking forward at the Saturn V. That was one of those aha moments. It was fun seeing him realize that. So. Fortunately, didn't make it. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't have been good. Wouldn't have been good. Good question. Fresh, fresh, yes. Did none of you feel anything about the duality of the fact that we're researching for war and researching for space? Did that ever bother you, that overshadowing each other? And how did you feel about it? Yeah. Uh, Repeat the question. Basically, I'm saying that no. you have the duality of their uh, uh, research for war and research for space exploration. Just how did you feel about that? I'm asking you how they felt when they were there, knowing what was going on in London and that sort of thing. And then also being from Austin, you're going to have a whole range of emotions. Yeah. And I was just curious. It is. And uh, uh, Ruth from Slumber, she, was, she, was, she spoke very well about that. Uh, can't blame the really one of the engineers. Uh, I know the first night that we were there, they had these, maybe second night, they had these slideshows and engineering drawings and all that, and it was the, uh, the fuzz bomb engineers were in there. And uh, it was so, it was kind of mechanical, you know, and I'm thinking, do you ever think about who's going to get, the, you know, at least, the, at least the V2 had a, you know, a space application, if you will, or a, you know, a, a benefit side of it. But the buzz bomb, you know, it was just a thousand pound bomb going to, you know, land on a building or buildings in London. And I, I, I don't, did I express that? I came back to our room. I, I, I'm feeling, feeling kind of down, you know, a little negative. But, yeah, because you, you've got to wrestle with it, obviously. You've got to wrestle with it. But I think, you know, hearing about the, the 10, which I didn't realize, makes you think that, yes, they definitely were thinking about it. And after thinking about what, like, with what Ruth said, it allows you to transcend you know, that horrible time, I think. And to get, to get down to the answer, yes, there was something further down the road yet to be discovered, yet to be evaluated, to research. And then what, what happened? They came to Huntsville, and we, we know the end of the story at that point, I think. Well, you have to realize, we gave them exactly the same choice when we brought them over here. Mm -hmm. that they were here to make our ballistic missile system to use against our bad guys. Right. And, and, and who was it that said, uh, you know, Von Brown, I mean, he was arrested. It got pretty serious. It, it took uh, it took General Norberger to really get him out. Otherwise... It, Went straight to Hitler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a dangerous time. But he was talking about, uh, Von Brown talked about space and not concentrating on the war effort and all that. And they said, went to, went to Fort Bliss and got some, a little bit of that same feeling from the, from the Army folks, you know. Hey, look, folks, we're working on this redstone rocket ship. It's, uh, it's not necessarily a time to talk about space. But they did it every night, right? Yep. And it paid off. Explorer 1, January 31st, 1958. Go Army. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Baker. We can tell the story. All right. All right. Why don't we move on into Jackie Dannenberg's return to Pain Amendment, 1991. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Jackie Dannenberg. I've been accused of being Conrad's daughter, his granddaughter. You name it. But um, this 30-year-old adult space camper was so enamored with the space program, she just couldn't get enough. So <clears throat> we were very fortunate, our adult space camp group, to get to hear a Von Braun engineer by the name of Conrad Dannenberg when he was introduced. I thought they said Comrade Dannenberg. I said, I thought he was German, not Russian. <laughs> but anyway, so after the talk was over, I followed him around like a little puppy dog. I had all kinds of questions. And he said, well, I have a paper on rocket propulsion. He walked around Space Center trying to find it. Well, let me have your address, and I'll send it to you. I'm like, yeah, right, sure. Next week, there it was, right? He was good on his word for everything. So the adults decided to come back again next year. And I had been writing back and forth with Conrad. His wife had passed away in 88, and so this was 
no, 87. And this was 88 and 89. And uh, so when I came back, I'd been writing back and forth with him so much, he decided to take me out to dinner to Old Heidelberg. That's where our first date was. <laughs> so anyway, I decided upstate New York, 30 below for three weeks of a stretch gets real old real quick. So I decided this was a good place to try. Well, he kind of sat back to see how long, uh, how serious I really was about moving here. And um, so when he was finally convinced, he decided he was going to hire me. Anybody heard of the gas program? Gas 007, he worked on that. It was for Space Shuttle. He was always teaching, always teaching, wasn't he, Anita? So anyway, so I moved down here, ended up working for the Space and Rocket Center and everything, and all these space campers and all these space geeks and all that. I really wished every one of you had been a fly on my shoulder. Conrad opened so many doors and I was able to do so many things, one of which was to go to Pan and twice. Here we have a picture. You said you had a little clip. Nope, I'm good. Let's see. That one. Right, okay. Um, anyway, Panamunda, the rocket, is in the upper right-hand corner. Okay, this green, okay. So that's where they work, work the best, okay? There's Carl Hagen, where everybody lived for the most part, and all this is the V1 area through here. Here's the construction that Dick was talking about um, in the film where they were uh, cleaning out the trees and getting ready to build. This is the first VAP. Bernard Tessman, if I had to do it all over again, I would have spent so much more time with him and your dad, Klaus, because the test area was my most exciting thing out at Marshall. Bernard Tessman built the first VAB in Panamunda. He built the first test stands in the United States out in White Sands, helped build the launch pads at Kennedy Space Center, and he helped, as well as the VAB, and he helped build the, well, the test stands at Marshall Space Flight Center. And he was just absolutely an incredibly interesting person to talk to, as well as Klaus's dad as well. Here's a little bit of the construction stuff going on. This was the entrance, one of the entrances um, into Panamunda. The train, thousands of people getting off to go to work. This is how it looked when we were there. I don't know if it looks the same now or not. This is the Hotel Baltic. Okay, this is from the beach looking back at the hotel. 600 rooms, two telephones. <laughs> they finally admitted that they limited the number of telephones because there weren't enough people to listen. And they finally admitted it. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Okay. There's another picture. You saw the hotel in the background when all the um, team members and workers and whatnot were reuniting back there. So this is where we had a lot of our um, talks, you know, where the presentations went on and all that sort of thing um, into the wee hours of the morning. These guys, you couldn't hush them up. It was great. This is, um, they signed this September 11th through the 16th of 1991. So if you have confusion about the dates, there it is. And they all signed it. Conrad's is there somewhere. And this is, um, now this here, a lot of people that is very significant because Herman Oberth was Warner Von Brown's mentor. And he had been hired years before to work on a film called The Frau im Mond, which is Lady in the Moon. And so for the first successful launch of the V2, they just so happened to have her painted on their V2, which launched on October 3rd, 1942, which we said. And my favorite rocket engineer right there. This is another entrance to the uh, Penamunda facility. <coughs> this was the office building. That was Von Brown's office right there, you can tell, because it has that little platform right there. Conrad's office was there. Second floor? Uh-huh. House four? Is that what it was? House four, I think it was. 
These are some of the, the Ziegler, where the people live. This is Testian 7. Now, Bernard Tesman told me that when they were building this, they, they built this earthen wall. And Conrad for years said that was to protect. And Bernard Tesman said, nope, you're wrong. When we built that, I wanted to move all the dirt down towards test stand one. And he talked to Dornberger about it. And Dornberger said, well, we don't have the money to do that. We have to just put the dirt around there. But why do you want to move it anyway? He says, well, because basically it says bomb here. Yeah. And this is um, some of the facilities. I unfortunately can't see it real good. One thing that we have not mentioned is the Glasfalta Oi, which is where they launched um, the A1s and the A2s before ben Penamundo uh, proper was built. Um, looked just like a V2. If you watch a launch into the air, you can't tell the difference between that and the A4. But this was some of the. This is a small scale model of uh, Testian 7. There's the VAB. They rolled it out here, took it out there. This is where they tested it. And they, no, that's where they launched it, that's where they tested it. Museum? Huh? Museum. Trenches that are left. Yeah, yeah. Remember seeing all the water in the trenches? Well, that's before the water. <laughs> and there we are getting, uh, they saw in the Milo wagon, uh, which is the transporter, right there. Ran on Volkswagen engines. And uh, they would take the V2 and uh, erect it and get it ready for the launch. There's that earthen wall. And these are the water pumps here, the water pump system. Hotel, uh, the Baltic Sea is on the other side of that earthen wall. <coughs> here they're working on guidance and control, getting ready for the launch. Now, by the way, you saw all these um, mishaps. Nobody in Penamunda ever got hurt during one of those mishaps. So they missed everybody there. It took two, three times to, to work like a charm, right? The first two didn't go right, but the third one did. Third, third time's a charm. So this was one of Conrad's slides during his rocket propulsion lectures, or rocket history as well. There you see him, there's the flame trench behind right there, and that's where they launched it from right there. Also had the first wind tunnel to go in excess of Mach 1. Dr. Rudolf Herman was in charge of that. And Conrad said, during this time in Penamunda, he had no idea. Even though it was within a mile or so, nobody had any idea, unless you worked in whatever division you were working in, had no idea that that wind tunnel was even existed. So there's a small scale model of the V2. If you want to read a good book, about Penamunda by Dr. Uh, Dieter Hutzel. If you want a hard copy, they're expensive. You can get them on Amazon, on Kindle. They're like three or four bucks. So from Penamunda to Canaveral, Dieter Hutzel. And Von Brown, as you can see, wrote the um, intro. Everybody got that? Or? Okay. Also, the B-2 in the United States, it was interesting. They tried launching it off of an aircraft carrier. As you can see, it didn't work real well. The aircraft carrier was kind of moving around and all that. This is, I guess, why the, this was in the United States, but the Germans didn't try it over there either. Julius Brown gave me that picture. And here's, that's the museum now, right? Or, no, the Kraftwerks, that was the old museum, that's right. This is 91, 92. the old entrance. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a small scale model of the entire town. And um, there's Conrad looking, looking at it. The um, guy who, um, he was still living there and he actually worked in Penamunda as a teenager. I'll think of the name in a little bit. Reinhold Kruger, I told you. I remember. There's Conrad the space camper. I just had to throw that in there. <laughs> Reinhold, and this is my friend Ron Caswell in, uh, 
as much and excited as I am about the space pro program, I hate flying. <laughs> so I t Conrad wanted to go, and he was going to go with his son and his grandson. And I was talking to Ron, I said, I really don't want to go. He said, well, I'll go, I'll carry his baggage, I'll do anything he wants me to. So he went, and unfortunately, Ron right now is probably in the last stages of his brain cancer. He got it a year ago, 65 years old. That's Kraftworks there. Now the Kraftworks was actually a electric plant, power plant in Penamunda. And the interesting thing was it was under construction and the Allies didn't bother bombing it because they could see there's no smoke coming out of the stacks anyway, so what's the point? Well, the joke's on them because the Germans had filters on it and you couldn't see the smoke. <laughs> So this is the part of the Baltic Sea. When we got there, there was a ton of Russian ships for sale. If you wanted one, you could go buy one. First, you know, if you had the money, go for it. That's the liquid oxygen plant that got bombed. That's Reinhold with Conrad there at Testing 7, I believe. This side, this is, um, it doesn't have a V2 in it, so I'm thinking this is test stand one, where they just fired the engine on, on test stand. They did not, it's kind of like the F1 test stand um, out at Marshall, which no longer exists. There you see the engine, they could rotate it to test the guidance and control and all that sort of thing. Okay, so this is the schematic, and there's the real thing. And of course it's off Deutsch, so if you can read it, have at it. There's your flame trench, that was when we were there. That was a bridge that went over it, right? At that time, I believe it was. It's seen better days. This is Karl Heinz Rohrville. He now owns the Hermann Oberth Museum. And he's been a spa space geek since he was a little guy. And every time anybody was around doing anything space, he was there. And uh, he actually, whoops, he actually came to the United States right after Conrad passed away and found, I had no idea, on the floor in the closet in Conrad's office was Conrad's two Panamona diaries from 1941 to 1944 that were entries both from him and his future wife, Inga, at that point. You remember they said, oh yeah, we all had boyfriends? Well, Conrad married his secretary, his mathematician, Inga. And that's Dr. and Mrs. Rudolph with Conrad. I'm sure everybody's heard the story about them. And there's a launching of a V2. These are just different launches Phases. There's your water pump system, just like we do today, to keep it all cool during test firing or launches. This is October 3rd, 1942. I know this picture real well. You know, Heidi wanted me to go back with them in 2010, and in all honesty, you know, Conrad had just passed away the year before. We'd been married 19 years. And um, I had the best tour guide back then. And I was afraid, really, if I went there with her, I'd just be crying the entire time. Because, you know, we had such a good time. There was so many of the engineers from here that went over there. Reese, Schlitt, you know, I mean, you saw them all in the, all in the movie. And I, I couldn't have had a better tour guide, so I was happy with that. So, and they launched them militarily, obviously. They launched them three at a time. The interesting story behind that is you'd have this bunch of soldiers, they'd set up the launch pad on a street. Any side of the street will work. You know, they didn't need this big launch prep, nothing. They just set them up with the model wagons on their little launch pad, launched them, took off, and by the time anybody from the Allies was looking for where they'd been launched from, they were long gone. It was a pretty quick situation. 
And of course, this is after um, they met up with the Americans and Bob Brown was in a bad car crash. Uh, he was not driving, somebody else was driving. So he had his arm in that cast, and I understand they didn't fix it right, and they had to re-break it. Without anesthesia. Without anesthesia, that's exciting. And then, of course, it led to the Saturn V. Huh? It was available. Oh, okay, yeah. You know, uh, we're, we're celebrating the um, 50th anniversary, this is the last slide, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. It's kind of funny, because people would ask Conrad, so, um, how do you feel about landing on the moon? He said, ah, we proved it on Apollo 8. We did everything we needed to on Apollo 8. <laughs> Marshall's job was done after Apollo 8. So anyway, a um, couple of stories, um, some funny not so, and a couple not so. I asked Conrad, I said, so what did you do during the bomb raid? He said, well, we had block houses. I said, so what did you do? I slept. I said, you slept. What else was there to do? Okay. Um, what, well, it sounds just like him, doesn't it? And then um, on the other side of the coin, Mrs. Rudolph um, and her daughter at that time was five years old, Mariana. And they were in this rectangular shaped bunker. Cement, boy, the Germans believed in cement like you can't believe. Anyway. There's another story some other time about some of the bunkers that they had on the English Channel where they were going to launch V2s from. One was the huge building that was two meters thick of reinforced concrete. And the Allies figured out what was going on and they actually bombed that while, the, while they were pouring the cement. So they figured, well, they've got us on that one. So they went to another spot in France and they dug out of this little hill and they built all the tunnels that they were going to process them and wheel them out and launch them. Well, just as they were figuring out all that, um, the Allies figured out that something was rotten in Denmark and they had to do something about it. They were just putting the support ring on the top of it, and we went up there. Uh, that was the first time we got, I got together um, when Conrad went to the Pen and Wonder reunions. And, uh, up at the top, somebody had written June 1944 on it. It was kind of eerie. <laughs> but um, just as they were ready to put this um, reinforcement ring on top, the Allies figured it out and they bombed it. Well, anyway, back to the bomb raid. Um, Mrs. Rudolph was sitting on one end, and Mariana was sitting down on the other end, playing with a couple of little kids. And I don't know, something just came over Mrs. Rudolph, and she just wanted Marianne in her lap. She's called Marianne and said, come, come sit on my lap. It wasn't five minutes later, the place got bombed and that end of the bunker had collapsed. It's just crazy. There's, there's a lot of stories um, that I won't get into, but um, it, it was a very interesting time. Like Ruth von Sommer said, you, you just don't have any control over the situation. Some, some soldiers, if they didn't want to do things, they, then the SS or whatever would threaten their families. If you get them, they threaten the families. So, you know, you just really get caught between them. Doesn't give you any excuse, really, but war is nasty. So, anyway. Any questions? I need you to move. <laughs> okay. said, we decided we'd go back to visit. In 2010, I managed to talk Ed Buckby into going with us. So, wanted to see what it was like. Actually, I had been in Germany from 1987 to 89 with an Air Force husband at Ramstein. The wall was still up at that point. Uh, so, uh, we didn't go visit. We didn't have time. It just wasn't 
but the wall came down while we were there. And my son got to go on a train. He was 12 at the time. No, he wasn't 12. Anyway, he was about 10. He got to go on a train with the Boy Scouts to the Berlin Wall, and he managed to chisel off some little bits. And I made him write that up once he got back. It was, boy, tying him down to do that was tough. Now he thanks me for that, because it was such a unique experience. What a, what a chance happening it was for him. So he got to do that. I didn't get to go, so. This was my chance to go back. 2010, we decided we'd go back and see what it was like. <laughs> Meanwhile, I had gotten in touch with a, uh, I was corresponding with a German, you meet a lot of space geeks, like we do here, right? At the docents at the Space and Rocket Center. But through various channels, I had met uh, Dr. Carl Otto Mawa, who was very interested in, in maintaining the history of what the German, he had grown up all of his life behind the Iron Curtain. In fact, he escaped with his family, wife and two children in 1987. He said, I just couldn't take it anymore. He came out with just, they just went to visit friends, so they came out with nothing. And then two years later, the wall comes down. But he had uh, defended his mechanical engineering thesis in Russian in St. Petersburg. Just an amazing fellow, and he was, he was very into the history, so he and I were in touch. He said, oh, well, I'll set up a tour for you when you come. So in 2010, September, October, we headed out. So, so the participants in that first one were Ed Buffy and Charlie Bradshaw, the Helsers, if you know Dr. Helmut Helser, the Grouse. Now, this will be the children. The two original members were Ed Buckby and Charlie Bradshaw, and the Hulsers, the Grouse, the Tylas, and the Teals, and the Webbers. So, first it was just Ed Buckby, and then all of a sudden I get a call one night, and this man says, it's Charlie Bradshaw. Sadly, Charlie just passed away just about two months ago. <laughs> I'm guessing some of you probably worked with him. He was the deputy at the comp lab, worked for Dr. Helser. I'll back up a little bit. So he calls me up and he says, Heidi, I want to go with you to paint a moon. And I thought, who is this guy? So he explains a little bit and he said that Barbara Helser had told him that we were making this trip and he'd like to join in and he could travel with Ed Buckby. Well, I was visiting Dieter Brown regularly on Friday nights. So I thought, I gotta find out a little bit more about this Charlie Bradshaw guy. So ask Peter, uh, Dieter Brown that weekend, that Friday night, I said, who is this Charlie Bradshaw? He thought for a minute. He got that twinkle in his eye that he was, that he had. Do you remember that? Yeah. And he said, he was the magician that made the comp lab work. He said, Dr. Hulser was the brains, the genius. He was always up here, the visionary. And he said, it's Charlie that kept things, the management, he kept things going at this. So I like that. He was the magician that made the comp lab work. And Charlie was a great addition to this trip. He was wonderful. We just had, we had grand time. So again, and so the Helser children, Barbara, and the two Grau children, the Tylers, the uh, Cotting Teal, and I'll point out pictures of her, and then my two sons went with us. The German historians, Dr. Carl Otto Mawa, set up the trip. I mean, this was reg regimented. It was every day. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. I was spending too much. He said, Heidi, you got to keep these people from, you know, taking so much time at meals. I said, I can't stop them. <laughs> but he had, he had his, his agenda clearly laid out. But it, it was wonderful. So we would tour during the day, and then in the evenings we would hold seminars in a forestry place. That It was a community center type of place. And this forester is where Dr. Helser had worked earlier during the war, so and it had been built up and it was in fact named for him. So we were having our seminars there at night, you'll see a few pictures of that. So it was Carl Otto Mawa, Carl Heinz Rohrbilt, the young one that Jackie pointed out, and Dr. Olaf Grabilski, Axel Kopsch, who was the one that set up our travels in 2017, because sadly Dr. Carl Otto Mawa passed away in 2015. Marcus Rayberger, he's a space geek, young fellow. He works at, he said, I got the best job ever now. He works at 
He said it's the equivalent of space camp, but in Germany. He works in Lumpelshausen now. So I'm hoping he's able to come to this year's celebrations. I have not heard late. Joachim Zatov. Now that's an interesting fellow. Yeah, Joachim Zatov. Retired colonel from the Russian military. In 2010, when we went, he was the one that held the keys to the compound. So the part, the old part where the launch, the research facility where the army was, where our dads had worked, and Conrad, is locked off because there's still live ordnance supposedly in that area. So that particular part is locked off. And there's a, a fenced area to draw us. Not, oh, that's right! And there wasn't when you went in 91. You walked everywhere. No, there was live ordnance in there. But it just wasn't fenced around, off. Around so Jackie you know, that too. Blake always went ahead of it. <laughs> <laughs> Clever man you are. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, Zatov had the keys again, and he had two old, old vans that you'll see in some of these pictures. With it, interesting, but he, you had to go through him, and you paid him to gain entrance to the compound, to the locked-in area. So those are the things we toured, the grounds, the harbor, the cemetery, and the museum. And you can see development between 2010 and 2017. Let me tell you a little bit of background, and I've realized this because Ralph Heusinger just wrote me. He said his siblings, are they're all three, and their spouses are going to revisit Painted Munda here in a few months. He said, oh, just give me the name of whoever I need to contact. Well, it's not that easy because it's still a political situation there. There is the museum that's owned by the state that's in, that's in the, the old power plant, and I'll show that in a minute. But... So there's that, but they have to follow the state line, which is they receive money funding from the state. Well, they can't celebrate Von Brown and the team, so they don't. And then there are two groups that celebrate the Von Brown team and come back and have a reunion every year. And they made that coincide with our time in 2017. So there's those people you contact, and they will give you a tour, and those are usually the ones that we have gotten the tour from. So, so the Havis Versuchsanstalt, so that's the Army Research Facility, Panamunda, 1937 to 45. And that's, Jackie showed you quite a few pictures of that. So that's the Army part. We'll go to a map. So there's on the Baltic Sea. So here's Usador on the island. You see Germany and Poland and Sweden and so forth, so you can place it up here. And we've got another map that Anita Palman brought for us that she used in her classroom of Germany, so we'll bring that out at the end of the show. You can look at it in more detail if you'd like. So the, the Oi is a small island out here that Jackie was talking about where they did some launched some test launches and so forth before they got the place built. So here, here again is the island of Usadon. Peenemunde is, there's a small town here. This is where the Luftwaffe, the Air Force worked and developed the V1s. The Havis, the German Army Research Facility where Von Brown and the team worked is here. And then again, up here is Test Stand 7. And there it is again. Were the test stands one, two, three, four, five, and six? They were down the island. Uh huh. They were. This was the main one, but those. So they were on down this way. We visited a few of those, but they're hard to get to some of them. But on the first trip in 2010, we were able to. We didn't do that much touring around on the next trip. But again, there's test stands seven. <laughs> So this was our group. I mean, so there's Ed Buffy and Charlie Bradshaw right there. And there's Dr. Carl Odenbaugh. So this is the Siler son. Those are my two sons. That's Siler's son, outsider's son. That's uh, Barbara Helserbeck. 
Colleen Teal, who will be here this summer if her husband doesn't have to have surgery. And these are the Grau family. That's Peter Grau, Evelyn <laughs> Grau, Peter's wife. And there's Carl Heinz Rohrbelt. The plaque. Hmm? We have the significant supporters standing. Oh, that's right, because yeah, it changed from what you did. Yeah. There was not that stone available in 1989. You noticed it was, now they have <coughs> checked it out, measured, and so forth, but there's still some controversy if they found the correct spot where this stone is. That's claimed to be the official launch site of in 3 October 1942. <coughs> And that's what it says. You're still looking for the live board close. <laughs> yeah. So here, here are those two vans, and there's Zatov giving us the talk. <laughs> this is Ed Buckby giving one of the talks, seminar talks in the evening. And then this is there's another seminar. This is Charlie talking that evening. Charlie Bradshaw. And this is one of the dinners in the evening, so we had all our meals together. Now this is Kylie Teal standing next to an old V2 engine. She found out that her great uncle, it's Vata Teal, who was heading up the guidance and control, BSM is what it was, the measurements and so forth. He, his wife, and their two children were killed in the, the bombing raid when the, when the uh, British came in August. And so she, whoops, sorry, I'm trying to get the point. She saw to it that that their graves were marked. So she, that's the significance of this. She's gotten stones. She's made that her. And he was Conrad's boss. Uh -huh. Also my father's death. Hmm. All right, so this is what the Kraftwerk or the power plant looked like way back then. You've seen it. And now it looks like this. It's the museum. They've got the old rail car that was the executive rail car in which they took, went on the trains. And then, of course, there's the A4, V2. My friends in Germany that are on the two groups that support the Von Braun team, they said, Heidi, here we call it the A4. So I had to be careful. I, had to, I was supposed to call it the A4 there, not the V2. But of course, I generally I'm familiar with the V2 and tend to call it that. So. And that's how the museum is marked now on the sidewalk as you're coming in. And the V2 that stands outside. So then the next trip, 2017, we went to mark the 75th anniversary of the first successful launch into space. We invited Dr. Deborah Barnhart to go with us. She said, absolutely yes. So she went and she filmed most of the time. So that was a good trip and we had quite a few with us. So the Vikings were represented, the Helsers, the Teals, Weber's. Um, Dua came from Norway where he now lives. He used to live up the street for me growing up now. So he joined us and Willie Lay's daughter came to join us. Zenia Parker, or Lay Parker. And the German historians, Axel Kopsch was our lead to set up the, set up the three days that we were there, the seminars and so forth that we did. Then Professor Ben Ullmann, a real unique fellow, he will come give a talk here on the 17th of July. I suggest that you try to see that. It will be no, it will not be at the library. It will be at the Space and Rocket Center in the Discovery Theater. 2.30, I believe, but you need to check. It's on the schedule. And he will deliver the talk that he delivered for us there. He became just, he loves analog computers, the history of them, and so forth. So he's written papers on Dr. Helser, Helmut Helser. And he delivered this particular paper to us. Dr. Barnhart said, oh, we've got to get him to come and do this in the US. So he's coming. And he'll deliver pretty much the same, same talk. He lives apparently in two houses, two huge houses in Frankfurt, where he's a professor at a university there. 
Most of the house's wife tells me that they, they live in two small rooms, and then most of the rest of the house is all his museum, for example, on computers. So you'll find another passionate fellow in you. So please do come to his talk. Now, the, again, the Colonel Joachim Zatov is the one that I mentioned from the, had been in the East German military. And then Reiner Siegmund is a real quiet spoken fellow, but they're building another museum that are more the ones that are enamored with the technology, technological advancements that the Von Braun team made. So. so this is what pretty much what it looks like today. It's very green and overgrown. So again, you see, barely see any of Test N7 up here. And most of this, this is the, again the fenced in area that you need to get access to and pay to get in. And this is a, the, you said that was an Air Force course for the, the Russian military used that during the Cold War. The town of Penamunda is coming back. Again, this is all a resort area, beautiful beach here, town of Karlshagen down here. So you can, you're starting to build up hotels again. We did not stay at the Hotel Baltic. Jackie suggested it and didn't, didn't consider it a good idea. So we stayed in 10 different hotels. So this is the museum that they're building up on their own that's very close to the front, what was the front gate of the Army Research Facility. They've got this huge diorama set up here. Amazing, tiny little houses. And this is Michael Hartley. He's standing next to this, just, I could not believe it. This is a V1 that they converted to have this yeah, to have a pilot. It was Hanno Reich, the German female ace that, well, I don't know what color ace. She was an aviatrix, I should say. So, and she came back to talk about it. She survived that. But that's what's left of it. So, and the various bits that they're pulling out of the Baltic Sea and so forth, but they're trying, they do have this area. So this is Reiner Siegmund here, who ended up pretty well giving us the tours. Otto kind of stood in the background, but we, we're still using his vans to get onto the compound. Dr. Barnhart right here filming. This is Xenia Parker Lay. And here we are at the, here's the trench. Looks pretty much the same as it did when you saw it. So here's Professor Bernd Ullmann and his wife, Rika Nitzan. So you'll recognize them when they're here this summer. And we had a small memorial rocket launch that morning to celebrate the first successful launch in the space. So there we were around the stone and here were some of the dinners. Right here is Eric Durr, who came from Norway. I've got to tell you that I didn't have a chance to get the picture in, but there were two fellows that were sitting back here at the table the last night, but they were sitting right up here, these two fellows that sat with my, the first two nights we had meals on boats, so we're kind of walking like this to get to our tables, and my son and daughter-in-law sat down at a table with Erica Michael Hastings, so she, she wanted to be around a younger person. So I headed off another way, and my son told me this story later on. He said there were these two older gentlemen that I was trying to point out to you sitting at the table. So my son is agonizingly trying to speak German and asking him about the menu and the, the, how's the day been and so forth, and they're kind of looking at him. And then finally they say, well, oh, we've had a fine day, thank you very much. <laughs> we, we're going to order such and such. So British, it turns out, they are. These are two brothers that were bombed by V2s on their farm in southern England. But my point with this is they love the history. 
they come back to celebrate the technology every year, the history that was made. They let bygones be bygones. They're, they're, they come back, and as I say, every year they are there celebrating the technological advancements. And he took my son out to show him where there was a Lancaster that had gone down in the lake nearby, and he had marked it off with a historic marker. So, war is hell, but. We can't go beyond it. So. These are good get-togethers. And again, they meet every year. So. And there's Dr. Barnhart right down there in the corner. Yeah. So that's what I, oh, 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 there's more. Hang on. There's the note. We wrote letters. Axel Kopsch made us all sign letters, all of us that were to Ms. Stuhlinger. So Chris, your mother, to Mrs. Von Brown, and <laughs> to someone else. But I re received this thank you note from Maria Von Brown for, for that letter, so that was very special to me. That's why I wanted to share it with you. And then another friend sent this one at kind of, it's a beautiful area, resort area. That's it. Any questions? Where is the cemetery where the fields are buried? It's very close there. It's all in, in that same area. Is it inside it's, the block up there? No, no, it's not. No, no. It, they showed where you went also, where Conrad was in the audience. That's a, it's a cemetery area there. It might be Karlshagen, but generally there, there are several villages near around there. I didn't get to I didn't get to go there when they visited on the 2017 trip because I had a little side trip with Dr. Barnhart. We she had been trying to the museum folks. So you get a little story here. The museum folks, the official museum, Panamunda Museum, the state museum had asked for her to come visit them. Well, she had been trying to contact them from the day before and as soon as she arrived, she was sending email, text, whatever she could, and she kept, even in our seminars, she was texting and they wouldn't answer her. Well, it turns out the fellow, the head of the museum, had been ill, so hadn't been at work for a few days, but then the other fellow was supposed to step in, the head archivist, but she was not getting a response. So it turns out, so we got there Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday morning, we've decided to go for a hike. And so the forester has taken us for a hike, and so we're on the Baltic Sea, beautiful, on the beaches and so forth. And all of a sudden she gets notification that, oh, you can come at 4 o'clock this afternoon, so the last day. She had to leave that evening, headed for the airport in Berlin to go to Saudi Arabia, so flying out. So she said, okay, Heidi, you want to go with me? I said, sure. So meanwhile, the rest of the group was going to the cemetery. It's dark, it's dreary, it's rainy that afternoon. And we're going in the front door. Again, it's already dark. And all the people are coming out because the museum closes at 4 o'clock. And we're going in, and the lights are out. And they meet us, these two archivists meet us at the front entryway. And they take us upstairs and have cookies and coffee and meet at their little table. I thought, wow, this is really something. They have us each a little swag bag. And... So then we went down, and Dr. Barnhart starts filming as we go downstairs. They take us into the archive, or the storage area downstairs. They've been fishing nose cones of the V2s out of the Baltic, and these are set up and so forth. They, they really are doing a nice job of taking care of what they've got there. It's all and well cared for. So that was fun getting to see the bowels of the museum. Yeah. Did you ever, ever get one of them? <laughs> Funny you ask, did you know that story? <laughs> she, yes. Dr. Barnhart has tried to get one for this year's celebration. She wanted one here. But I'm not sure it's going to, I helped translate the the request letter that went through Ed Stewart at the archives here, and but I'm not sure they're going to be able to get it here this year. So, 
You do? They think so, yeah. They still think so, okay. I talked to Ed about it a couple of days ago. All right, you may see the nose come a little steeper. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Fun trip, historical. And you meet good people that are along the same, passionate about space history. So. That's a I do a lot of this stuff unscripted, so sometimes I'll forget things. Carl Hines and I, Royal, there's been talk about, you know, you can still, yes, get killed by unexploded ordnance from World War II around Testian 7. Carl Hines, not knowing this, and I walked all around that earthen wall. <laughs> yes, we're still here, but apparently somebody had lost their hand a couple weeks ago or something like that when we were there. Conrad, his job um, at Penamunda, he started out as a diesel guy, diesel engineering. And so they decided, well, they've been having a lot of problems with the fuel injectors on the V2 engine. You know those little cones and you got a series of those little brass fuel injectors? That was his first job, was the fuel injector on the V2. When I used to do the NASA bus tours, the guys out of the test end areas gave me a um, space shuttle main engine turbine blade. So I, you know, you go from this to a, a titanium turbine blade, which is about this big by this big, which represents 700 horsepower at the rate of 37,000 RPM. So it's so, I have seen the 50th anniversary at the place where it was launched from the V2, the A4, Bumper 8 in Florida with the bumper guys, um, was around with Conrad for um, <clears throat> the first launch of uh, Sputnik, and then of course um, Explorer 1 that Mike Baker was very much involved in, whether he wanted to or not, because Conrad insisted, <laughs> even though he was exhausted. Can I tell that story? Um, Mike had been here there everywhere, just was going nuts, getting everything done. He was absolutely tired and, and, and worn out in 2008. <clears throat> and he said, Conrad, I just, I'm afraid I can't do it. And so let me do the math. Um, yeah, and Conrad said, well, Mike, let me, remind, let me remind you I'm 86 years old and I'm doing the one at the Space and Rocket Center. I think you can handle this. <laughs> so it's so interesting to see all the 50th anniversaries from the first day four to now. I can just imagine what it must have been like to live it from 1942 to now. But again, as far as Conrad was concerned, Marshall proved it with Apollo 8. <laughs> so. Any other questions? <clears throat> Thank you all for coming.